Hi, my name is Joan Kang, and I am one of the Senior Career Services Advisors here at Santa Monica College in the Career Services Center. And today I will be talking about resume writing for STEM majors. Topics I will be discussing include what are federal resumes, civilian resumes and CVs, why a resume, what does your resume say about you, what are general layout and formatting guidelines, what belongs on your resume, and where do you go for additional help? On the side, these are three types of documents that you might be asked to submit. If you are applying for a U.S. government job, you'll be asked to submit a federal resume. Federal resumes have a very specific format to use, and you will find the format by visiting usajobs.gov. They typically require very specific and detailed information about your qualifications, trainings, background, work experience, and other personal content. And therefore, your resume can be much longer than a traditional resume, which is considered to be called a civilian standard private sector resume. These types of resumes are used for non-government postings for jobs outside of academia, teaching, or research-related positions. They provide a brief summary of your background and experience, and there's no standard format to use. For most students in the STEM field, during your first year and second year, and until you start building your research experience, you most likely will be submitting this type of resume a private sector resume or civilian resume. However, if you're thinking about doing more research, teaching in the future, especially teaching at the higher education level or higher ed level, you'll be asked to submit a curriculum vitae or CV. CVs provide a detailed look at your research and teaching experience, publications, conference presentations, awards, services, etc. And like I mentioned before, they are most commonly used when applying for academic jobs. You may also be required to submit a CV for a graduate school application and or research positions. And there's usually no page limit. So, why must you submit a resume? Why should you create a resume? Why do people need a resume? A resume is a marketing tool and not your own professional biography. It is used to sell yourself to a potential employer or program so that you can obtain an interview. An effective resume will show how your qualifications match what an employer or program is looking for in an ideal candidate. Therefore, when you are submitting a resume to a program or an employer, you will want to make sure that you target your resume. That means every resume that you submit should also be different. And you'll learn more about targeting your resume later on during my presentation. On average, what do you think is the amount of time an employer, program, recruiter takes to review an applicant's resume? Employers only spend about six seconds reading a resume. If you're lucky, even longer. The good news is that there is no one right way or magic way to write a resume. However, there are some best practices and standards And although there is no right way to write a resume, a resume can say a lot about you as an applicant. And here are some messages that your resume may say. It might share whether or not you can clearly and concisely explain your experiences and your skills, 
How good are you at following instructions or paying attention to detail? Do you have the experience that they need? And maybe are you neat and organized? Well-formatted resumes that flow naturally and share information that is relevant to the job description or program description speaks volumes about your ability to think and organize tasks. When an employer is looking for an ideal candidate, these details matter. So let's talk about the resume design. Here on the slide, you will find some don'ts and do's. Let's start off with the don'ts. I suggest that students do not download and use templates. Whether the templates are downloaded from Microsoft Word, Google Docs, Pages, through Google websites, and so forth, do not download a template. Most are not applicant tracking system um, friendly or ATS friendly. ATS is a platform that employers use to help them efficiently review applications, resumes, and content regarding a job that they may have posted or even an internship position. They scan your documents to see how close of a match you are to what their ideal candidate might be. You also wanna make sure that you avoid using tables, columns, text boxes, photos, graphic, etc. One, because they are very difficult to edit. And two, most of those documents that contain columns, text boxes, photos, graphics cannot be read by ATS systems. Finally, on your resume, do not include a list of references or salary information. Both of these will be asked of you during the hiring process or in the application in itself. Things that you will want to do include choosing an easy readable font such as Times New Roman or Arial and an appropriate type size, 10 point font, 12 point font. It will vary based on the font you choose. You're also wanting to choose a balance between adding bold, italics, underlining, large type sizes, and color. You do not want to overuse all of those features. For your resume, you also want to list relevant sections first, and relevant sections will be determined based on the program description or job description. On your resume, you'll also want to use bullet points, especially when you are needing to itemize items. Finally, you're gonna want to make sure that your targeted resume is only one page and that when you are asked to convert your document to a PDF, that it is a PDF text file versus a PDF image file. You'll be able to tell whether or not a PDF file is text or image-based when you try to select a specific letter or word in your document. If it highlights that only word or letter, then it is a text file. However, if you select a certain portion and it creates a large square over a section of your document, most likely you've created a PDF file with images in it. And again, employers that use ATS platforms may not be able to view a PDF image file. So let's talk about building your resume. Here are four tips that I suggest students follow. One, create a master resume. 
A master resume houses every bit of experience, your skill set, accomplishments, all written out in a professional resume format. It is where you store your career information and one that you could use to create separate resumes for each application that you're applying to. When you start writing your resume or creating your resume, start off with a blank page. Two, you're going to want to analyze the job description or program description. Make sure to review the description thoroughly. What is a job title and employment type? Are they looking for an intern, a part-time employee? Is it contract-based, per diem, full-time? What are the duties, qualifications, and responsibilities? What does the organization value? Are there any disclaimers for STEM students? Sometimes a disclaimer is something regarding your citizenship. Do you have to be a US resident, a citizen? Can you be an international applicant? What are the application instructions? Do they want a cover letter? Are there any supplemental questions that applicants must answer? Do you need to include a list of references? The third tip is do additional research on the program, the company, the people who might be hiring or a part of the selection committee. Find out if your values and interests and goals match the values, the mission and goals of the place that you're applying to. And finally, customize your content. Make a copy of your master resume. And on the targeted resume, make sure to include content, for example, your education, your experience, your skills, projects, trainings that relate to the specific description, whether it be a job, app, a job description or an internship description, research description, you're going to want to utilize the same language. Are they asking for your programming language knowledge? Then create a section on programming experiences or projects. Customize your headings. And again, be aware of ATS systems, applicant tracking systems. Now that we talked about the design of your resume. What are things that belong on your resume? For STEM resumes, there are typical sections that you might include. For example, a header, education, skills, trainings, certificates and licensures, experience. And depending on where you're at in your career, you might include an objective or a summary section. Let's start off with the header. Your resume header is a section that tops your resume. It is the first thing an employer or a program recruiter will check on your resume. Resume headers carry all your personal contact information from your first name and your last name. If you have a preferred name you want to go by, your address, a way of contacting you, and sometimes even a link to some of your work. Things I do want to point out in regards to your header include what information should you list as your address? I let students know that it is okay just to list your city and state, especially if you will be sharing your resume publicly. You also want to use a professional email address, ideally one that is not associated with the school that you're attending. And that is because sometimes when you finish attending that school, you may no longer have access to that email address. And this is going to be key if you need to reset a password. 
You also want to provide a number that an employer can contact you by and make sure that you have a professional voicemail message set up. Employers may not text message you during the hiring process. Finally, for some majors, as I mentioned, you're going to want to show some of your work. And for those who are going into engineering, computer science or computer information systems, the video game industry or any design tech industry, you will want to show your work via a portfolio, a website, or for those who might need to show your programming skills, a link to your GitHub account. For ATS purposes, make sure that this information is listed in the body of your document and not in the part of your document listed header or footer. Things that you want to exclude from your header or any part of your resume include information such as your birthday, your social security number, citizenship, marital status, sexual orientation, political affiliation, or religion. These things are not needed on a resume used in the United States. I also share with students that you should also use the same header on your resume as your cover letter and any other online application materials that you might need to submit. Here on this slide are three examples of a header. Feel free to also create a header that is right aligned. You may choose a color that might be blue. You might choose a color that can be green. I do suggest avoiding any reds, pinks, oranges, or light colors if you are going to use a color for your name. Typically after the header, most current students and recent graduates would list their education next. Your education is the most recent experience and most relevant experience. If you will be here at SMC and your goal is to obtain an associate's degree or certificate of achievement, make sure to list that information under your section. Let the employer know the month and year you plan on receiving your degree or certificate. If you've already received a degree or certificate, then list any honors associated with those degrees and when you receive the degree, month and year. You also want to include the name of the school that you attended and the city and state or city and country the school was located or is located at. If your goal is only to transfer or if you're planning on receiving a degree that is different from your transfer major, I also encourage students to list your transfer major. Some optional information that you might list under education include your GPA. I recommend only if it's a 3.5 or higher, if it's not a requirement of the application. Any study abroad opportunities that you participated in, a listing of your relevant coursework or ways that you're involved here on campus, as well as any awards and scholarships that you've received. Under education, you're going to want to exclude any high school education. So do not list that you received your high school diploma. And here on this slide, you will see four examples of how education might be listed on a resume.
Before I go on to the next section of our resume, I wanted to highlight two areas here on campus that I suggest that you connect with. The first area that I would like to highlight are the services provided by the Career Services Center and the importance of receiving career planning. At the Career Services Center, you'll have the opportunity to meet with both career counselors and career advisors. Our career counselors will help you define your career plan. That could be figuring out a career, a job, an industry option. It could be identifying your SMC and or transfer major to learning more about the skills that you need in a certain industry or job. I recommend that students see career counselors regularly. Career counselors are there to help not only students who are undecided, but also students who have decided on a major. And that is because careers can change, industries do change, skills can change. And you wanna make sure that you are most up to date on this information. You'll also want to see a career advisor to help build your career plan. They can help you research ways to build your plan and the skills that you might need. They can help prepare the documents to apply for opportunities such as your resume, your cover letter, a portfolio, any application materials. And finally, help you apply for those on and off campus opportunities. When meeting with the Career Services Center, you're also going to wanna to make sure that you share this information with your academic counselor. Your academic counselor can help you complete your ed plan. And your ed plan factors things like your educational goal, are you planning on transferring, receiving a degree, certificate, or a combination of these? They could also include any skills that you might need for a certain industry or job, or major, and that is because many of the skills that employers are looking for can be taught here at SMC through the classes that you take. And so when you're thinking about academic counseling, there are different areas that you could go to for academic counseling. You could see our general counseling or transfer center, and you could also go to specialized academic counselors. For example, the STEM program also has counselors that could help you with your ed plan. When you're a student, it's important that you take the information that you receive from the Career Services Center and your academic counselors to help you with your transfer plan as well as your goal career wise. And so here on this slide, I've listed the links on how to schedule an appointment with the Career Services Center as well as with academic counselors. The next section of your resume that you are going to want to include on a STEM resume are a list of your skills. You are going to want to focus on your technical hard skills, things that you could quantify, things that you could test. These are some examples of some technical hard skills of various industries. For your master resume, it is okay to list all of your hard skills, but when you are applying for a job, an internship or research opportunity where you are going to wanna to target your resume, make sure to prioritize those skills listed on the description first. Then demonstrate how you have those skills through examples. Here on this slide are two examples of how to list your skills. The next slide are two additional ways to show your skills for those who might be going into the home health industry or healthcare, or those who might be needing to show their field work experience. The next section that you might include 
as you develop your skills or know more about your career, you might obtain some training or a certificate or become licensed in your field. Here are examples of industry trainings, certificates, and licenses that SMC students have completed or are completing currently. Make sure when you are listing this information to include the month and the year that you completed it, or if you're still working on it, then the month and the year you expect to complete it. If any of these certificates or licensures have an expiration date, for example, first aid will have an expiration date. Some of our tech certificates might require that you update your knowledge and they will have an expiration date. Make sure to list expires and then the month and the year. Here on this slide are two examples of how to list some trainings Before we begin, begin the next section, I wanted to share a little bit more about trainings and certificates and where you might receive those types of trainings. Employers look at the specific skills on your resume. Whether you learn that through a course that you're taking at SMC, through private training, independent learning. An employer may not factor that into their hiring process. Their concern is more that you have the skill versus where you obtain that skill. Unless, again, that skill is a specific bachelor's degree that they are wanting you to have or an associate's degree. However, if they're looking at the individual skill, they are just wanting that you have that skill. So sometimes I refer students to open online courses because there are many benefits to taking an open online course or a massive open online course. One is that it can help develop and build on targeted skills across a range of subjects. It's a great way to figure out how your career will take shape. It's also a great way to supplement things that you're learning in the class. For example, if you need additional knowledge of a subject, you could take an online course through any of these platforms like Coursera, LinkedIn Learning, edX, Udemy, and so forth to add some knowledge. Sometimes students take these classes because they need to learn a skill that is part of their job industry, but not a part of their graduation requirements. College can be expensive. And so some of these online courses can be taken for free. And it depends on the course or program and as well as the platform. I suggest students look at your local library and see what access that you can have that will get you free courses and programs through platforms that are listed on this slide. If you're a resident of LA County or LA City, many of the programs that I listed here on this slide provide free options for you. Finally, a section that is typical of a STEM resume is a section that talks about your experience. Here on this slide are different things that might count as experience. For your targeted resume, 
don't forget you could customize your headings based on what is stated in the job or program description and possibly showcase your work in your portfolio or your website or your GitHub account. Students should also make sure that the bulk of your resume is focused on your experience. So how should you list your experience? First, you wanna make sure that you list it in reverse chronological order. Most recent first, for each section heading. You're going to include the job title, the start and end dates, in terms of month and year, the name of the company, the location of the company, whether it's here in the United States in the city and state, or if you had some experience outside of the United States, then the city and country. You're going to want to list your accomplishments and achievements using bullet points and action verbs. And these bullet points should show how you've used your technical hard as well as soft skills. You're gonna to wanna to highlight experiences that directly relate to the job or program description. And if you don't have any direct experience then focus on transferable experiences. You're gonna make sure that it is fact-based, that it excludes any personal pronouns or any unnecessary professional jargon, unless it's used in the job description. And finally, don't copy an old job description don't copy the current job description that you're applying to and try to trick the applicant tracking system. So here on this slide, you'll see two examples of how experience might be listed. As mentioned, relevant coursework is one type of experience. And here on this slide, it shows how a student um, took certain classes and what they learned in those classes. Here's some experience related to someone's customer service experience. On the next slide, there are examples of research experience, as well as a student who might have participated in some healthcare experience. And you will notice that the verb that they used either is in past tense with the ED or present tense. You'll see the dates are in reverse chronological order with the most recent experience listed first. You'll see the title of their role, where they did that role, and the city and state. Under experience, one thing that students also can include are projects. And projects highlight relevant experiences outside of what you do or have done at a job or school. It can also bridge the gap from what you're doing in school to what you want to do. It shows you have some background in your field when your experience section is limited. And that's going to be key for a lot of students, recent grads, or those who are changing careers. Um, and these projects can be things that you led or are part of. They might come from academic assignments, competitions, summer programs that you've participated in, past projects, freelance work, paid and unpaid side ventures. And so here are some examples on this slide of some projects that you might have, whether they're coding projects, creating lesson plans, some game designs, CAD um, designs, as well as research papers, those who might go into robotics, things that you've built, uh, for those who are more on the environmental side or or on the field research side, some experiences regarding your field mapping. So on this side, you will see some examples of some programming and robotics projects. It details both a technical and a non-technical description. And that is because your resume may be reviewed by someone who is in your field or potential field, but it can also be reviewed by someone who may not have the technical skills. For example, a general human resources recruiter or an office manager, 
that is doing the first initial scan of an application. And so again, you want to speak to both audiences. Since you may not know who's going to read your, your application first. Here's some examples of some engineering projects on this next slide. And then on the third slide of some field work experience. To help you describe some of the accomplishments and how you utilize some of your hard skills, you're going to want to make sure that you start each bullet point with an action verb. And on this slide, you will find some action verbs for your STEM resume, as well as STEM resume action verbs by function. Finally, two sections that you may or may not have on your resume are an objective and a summary. For an objective, an objective signals to an employer that you are clear about the position you are seeking and the position available with an employer. But you want to make sure that it's well crafted. Objectives can also hinder your chances of obtaining an interview if you list an objective that does not match the position for which you're applying to, or if it doesn't support the content of your resume. For most college students seeking an internship, research opportunity, even entry level job, you do not need to state an objective on your resume. A better way to share what you're trying to achieve is through a cover letter or through your personal statement or supplemental questions. Next is a summary of qualifications. Again, this area is typically considered optional and reserved for those with more professional experience. The summary is the first piece of information an employer sees at the top of your resume. It gives the reader a concise introduction to you, your expertise, industry, background training, and it's a way to briefly tie together your experiences and help employers understand how your varied experiences fit what they need. For most entry level applicants, you could list this information under your skills section. A summary is typically used for someone who might be changing careers from one mid-level position to another, but in a different industry. And they want to highlight how the skills they've learned in one industry can help them be successful in the industry that they're applying to. And so here on this slide are examples of some resumes. Here are two additional slides. And before I end the presentation, I wanted to specifically talk about the timeline for research positions. If you're thinking about doing a research position, you're going to want to plan ahead. We are in September, and so you're going to want to make sure that you review your resume with a career advisor. And just note that this can take several sessions. You're going to want to block off time to identify and apply for these opportunities, and you're going to want to be organized by creating a spreadsheet of the opportunities, listing the deadlines, the requirements, where you're at in the process of applying, and so forth. And then you're going to also want to start applying. Why is that? Because most of the applications post around this time of the year, and they close by November, December. There's only a small handful of opportunities that happen after November, and definitely not past March. So schedule an appointment with the Career Services Center to help you with this process. When you're applying for these applications to research programs, Make sure that you have a career advisor, a career counselor, an academic counselor, instructional faculty, review your application materials. Make sure to also review the actual application. See what's required of you. Does it require a personal statement, a resume, any recommendation letters? 
And you're gonna wanna start collecting that information now before the application is due. If you're thinking about references and who to ask, you're gonna wanna make sure that the people that serve as your references or write your recommendation letters are your college instructional faculty in the STEM program that can help describe how you will be successful in that research opportunity. People that can identify your specific technical skills. Here are on this slide, some examples of some resources. The Career Services Center, we can assist you with major career exploration as well as employment related resources. The counseling department in regard to academic counseling, provide additional support services for you as students. As STEM students, I encourage you to learn more about the STEM program because they are specifically geared to support your STEM goals. You can also apply to the STEM math program that provides additional services. The STEM program has academic counselors, they have tutors, they offer workshops. I also recommend that you get to know your faculty, introduce yourself, let them know why you're taking their course, why you're interested in that field, what are your goals academically um, and career-wise. Your instructional faculty are gonna serve as your recommendations, the people who write your letter recommendation, but they could also help review some of the documents that you need. And finally, two other areas that I'd like to highlight include the Writing and Humanities Tutoring Center located in Dresher Hall. They help you with writing support in any subject and at any stage in the writing process. The English 1E online writing consultation class is a non-credit free online course that offers students feedback on rough drafts. And this is open to all students. And finally, how to contact the Career Services Center. If you're looking to book an appointment, feel free to click on the link appointments with the Career Services Center. Let us know your availability um, and we'll be able to match you up with a career counselor or a career advisor. If you wanted to see us in person or know our phone number or find out where we're located, our contact information is listed on this slide. I also encourage students to follow us on social media. Our Instagram account posts a lot of positions that are available to different majors. They suggest tips. They refer you to workshops that are hosted by the Career Services Center, as well as other workshops and events sponsored by different departments here on campus. You'll also wanna follow our YouTube account because we post a lot of our recordings on our YouTube channel. I can't guarantee that all workshops are going to be recorded, but those that are recorded by the Career Services Center are listed on our YouTube channel. And finally, if you're looking to reach out to me directly, here's my contact information. As I mentioned earlier, I am a Senior Career Services Advisor here at the Career Center at Santa Monica College. And although I work with all majors, I specifically work with STEM majors as well as students who are within the health and wellness area of interest. If you want to get in contact with me, the best way to reach me is probably by email. Uh, send me an email, let me know who you are, why you're interested in meeting with me, and let me know your availability Monday through Friday from the hours of 8 a.m. to 4 o'clock p.m. It's gonna be much easier to reach out to you by email than it is by phone. As most of the time I am in appointments and will not be able to answer a phone call. If you're looking to find me, I'm also located in the Student Services Center in the Career Services Center on the first floor.